to get started officially good afternoon just waiting for persons to get settled and then we'll get started i know there are persons who have already joined us on the live streaming so if you could just be patient with us for another minute then we will get started Williams. So thank you gentlemen and welcome to this presentation where we are focusing on Afrocentricity in the Cayman context. And for this we are very happy to have President Emeritus J.A. Roy Bodden join us for this presentation. Before Noted as a former Minister of Education, Social
family having left the Cayman Islands and emigrated to Cuba to learn about common in that kind of society. It stayed with me so much so that in later years I got into trouble. This subject And in some circles, this whole notion of blackness. So I want to give you, I want to lay that in context. England in 1670, when it was to England by the Treaty of Madrid, and it wasn't the United States. until 1707. So in 1670 at the Treaty of Madrid. And a little before that, Oliver Cromwell had sent General Venables and Admiral Penn to capture Puerto Rico. So they captured Jamaica instead, and the rest is history. That was 1655, and England was involved in a protracted war with Spain. So a couple of years later, they got the Cayman Islands. So, eighth century, the settlement of Cayman. Now I call Cayman a frontier society. Other people have described it as that too, including Creighton, because as different from Jamaica, Cayman was settled off. America. These people, after the British had <laughs> from the Mosquito Coast. could see that there was Amerindian in them. And so this explains why they had that mixture of features between the black African peoples and the Amerindian peoples. And then in February also, a schooner came from Black River in St. Elizabeth with another load of slaves. And then we fast forward down to May of 1787, the Caymanian family, Joseph Wood, repatriated his family from the Mosquito Coast and brought them back to Cayman. So by this time, the Cayman Islands were, of not the Cayman Islands, I, let me correct myself, Grand Cayman, because Cayman Brac was not settled until much later. Grand Cayman was a colony in all for all intents and purposes on its way to development. It was but society without laws. Because the people who came here 
to settle for the most part were either sailors who were shipwrecked or they were people who were running from a society with prescribed rules and standards. And that was a perennial complaint of the people of Jamaica. In 1802, the governor of Jamaica, after hearing complaints about the lawlessness, sent down his assistant, Corbett, to do a census. And the first census was taken, and Corbett went back, and he reported. There was one thing about the Caymanian people. They were very industrious, catered for themselves. They were very, very good at developing what little arable land they had. So they had certain things in their favor. And then we fast forward to the whole business of slavery and the coming to grips beginning 1807 with the outlawing of the trade in slaves shipped in British vessels. And then 1817, throughout the Caribbean, the British territories, there was a slave registration, a census. But the Caymanian <coughs> slave owners didn't take part in that census. There seems to be a number of reasons which attribute to that. The first one is they say was there was some bad communication between the Cayman and Jamaica, and they said they didn't know. Another reason is that the Caymanian people were intransigent, the slave owners were intransigent, and they did not want their slaves counted because they had no intention in abolishing slavery. So I suppose we could choose whatever of those. Maybe it was a combination of all two. Now, in 1820, I'll come back to this. In 1820, there was an aborted slave uprising in Cayman, led by a woman called Long Celia. I'll just touch on that, put that in a corner for now, and come back to it a little later. But in the 1830s, in the 1830s, there was a great, massive slave uprising in Jamaica. As a matter of fact, many historians suggest that that was the death knell for slavery in the British Caribbean as we know it. The Sam Sharp Rebellion, Sam Sharp Rebellion began in Montego Bay and Sam Sharp was a Baptist preacher. Well, the, the rebels didn't win and Sam Sharp was eventually home, but the people in Cayman, the slaves in Cayman knew about that. The distinction between the kind of slavery which existed in Cayman and the slavery which existed in Jamaica was that mainly the slaves in Jamaica were plantation slaves. The slaves in the Cayman Islands were mainly domestics. And so while no slavery is ideal, there was a difference in the treatment. But I don't want to romanticize it. I emphasize that because there were slave courts in Cayman. They were charged and there were several famous cases, including one slave man being accused of practicing obeya. Went to the slave court and he was punished. The first deportee we had was, was a slave. There was another famous one called Primus. It may have been Primus that they deported. They deported him. He was tried, found guilty, and they deported him from the Cayman Islands. Now, to where? To where? I, I presume, I presume it was to the Mosquito Coast in Central America because in Central America. That's how we have the Garifuna people now, the mixture of Negro, Black, and Amerindian as a result of that. So that that's what happened then. The, the British were always threatening to bring some kind of order to the Cayman Islands from the 1830s. Attach the Cayman when slavery Four. 
participate in the abolition. So on May the 2nd, 1835, Caymanian slaves were completely manumitted. They completely got their freedom, their emancipation. So they didn't have to go through any apprenticeship period because originally, on August the 1st, 1834, they didn't have, they were not part of that. So they were finally manumitted on May the 2nd, 1835. So I'm told that that is when we are going to be celebrating our Emancipation Day. Uh, I, discussions are in, in train now for that. So until that time, the society was fairly settled. I mean, the slaves knew their place, and the near white Bakra owners knew their place. After that is when all hell broke loose because the slaves, many of them removed themselves from the employ of their masters and they moved away. And that's when places like North Side, East End, and Bodden Town to a large extent were settled by these black people on land that had not been claimed before that time. It's interesting, I was just reading about notes on the history of the Cayman Islands by George S.S. Hurst, who was the commissioner here in 1910. And I, I, I knew this from, from my observation, but the white people settled around the coastline, particularly in Georgetown. If you check the settlements, up, up South Church Street is where the rich white people live. The poor white people live on North Church Street on the coast. And there's a reason for that, because most of these people were ship owners. So quite naturally, their residence was where they could watch the goings and comings in the harbor. The black people took the interior lands, which were more fertile. And so the white people then, even, even in Georgetown, the white people said that the black people called them people in the bush. And so we have the bush. And uh, there was another unflattering name for them. They said they lived in Monkey Town because that's how they taught them. I tell you, I say this to tell you, I'm, I'm building a highway to the topic of racism, okay? So when the rest of this started, Governor Sligo was petitioned to send a detachment of the West India Regiment to Cayman. When the, reg when the regiment came, it was headed by a white officer, but all the soldiers were black. And so they had a problem. They had several problems. Because first of all, they found it difficult for places to bivouac the soldiers. And then there were some incidents where the soldiers were accused of doing things they didn't do. For example, there was an incident where a white man wanted a soldier to salute him. And of course, a soldier only salutes another soldier, particularly high up. And, and there was a fuss over that. And there were several physical altercations. Some soldiers were charged with rape, some of them with theft, none of which could be proven easily. And so that is where we had the first outbreak really based on racial lines. So what transpired then is that eventually the detachment of soldiers were removed, but by that time, the lines were drawn, and Cayman then, Grand Cayman, became a racially nuanced society. Now, if you talk with many Caymanians, they will tell you such a situation didn't exist, and it does not exist. But let me tell you, as a Caymanian, an old Caymanian, <laughs> it existed, and it exists. It exists in, in all elements of, of, of the society. So, even in my own family, we have incidents, incidents of that. Now, however, I am pleased to see that younger people have a different attitude and are curious 
and want to examine what this, what's the significance of race in the society. So the, the, the system of racial nuance and racial stratification continued until well into the 20th century. In 1953, when we have the beginnings of what I call modernity, we had a commissioner sent here from Lagos, Nigeria. He was a Scotsman. He is one of the heroes, one of my heroes of Caymanian history. Andrew Morris Gerard. And when Andrew Morris Gerard came to the Cayman Islands, he found a society which was racially stratified. There were no black people in the civil service. None. Okay? So there were few opportunities for black people to get by. One of the first things he did was he stripped away that layer of racism. When the British man of war came, the war ships, they could be called a man of war, came to the Grand Cayman for rest and recreation. They had two evenings of recreation, a ball on the Friday evening for the white folk and the officers. And although there was one orchestra, a black orchestra, black people were forbidden at that ball. That's where all the Near white Caymanians bought their daughters on show, hoping that they could catch a suitor of a white English officer. I'm telling you, that's what they did. They brought their daughters out, they decked them out, brought them to the town hall in Georgetown. So, Gerard came and said, This must not be the practice anymore. From now on, we shall have one ball for everybody. And they told him, Sir, it's not done that way here, you know. Those of us who are white, we don't associate with black people. We don't associate with these black. Gerard said, you call these people black? I came from Lagos, Nigeria. That's where I see black people. Okay. But in respect of that, there shall be only one ball. And they hated him. They absolutely hated him because he didn't stop there. He opened the civil service up to where it became a meritocracy. Skin color was less important than your ability to do the work. So he introduced the first black people into the civil service based on their ability. He did other things as well to make the society more egalitarian. And he dragged us kicking and screaming into the 20th century, trying to enlighten us so that we would shed these narrow racist opinions we had of, a, of, of, of ourselves and our importance. And until the men, the abandoned men went to see in large numbers, that racist barrier remained. When the men went to see, their allotments, the remittances they sent allowed the economy to develop in such a way that it was difficult. Color then became less important because black people became people of means, just like the near white people were. But before that time, there was little to no serious social interaction between near whites and the blacks. There were no significant number of marriages between near white Caymanians and black. So it was a very insular, very insular society. And we're just growing out of that insularity now. Now we've grown out of the insularity between near white and black. And we're into a different insularity now between us and the people who are not us, which is probably a bigger problem, a bigger problem that we have, we, that we have uh, to, 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 to solve. So the whole idea of blackness was taboo, was kinjiti. People didn't talk of that. But growing up, they talk about good hair, bad hair, light skin, dark skin, 
that's how people were that's how people would describe oh such and such a person has good hair yeah, it's good hair that person oh you see that hair man they have bad hair meaning if your hair was kinky it was bad if it was straight yeah it was good and so black people we ourselves were fooled because you had black people they, they used to use a no cream they used to use a hot iron and iron and a little iron heat it till it got almost red and put it through their hair i said why in the world are people doing this some people would have old pieces burn out of their scalp because then it doesn't matter how skillful you were you couldn't avoid touching the skull sometimes and i'd see all these people and i said these people are Indian. How come their hair is so straight? <laughs> <laughs> so we we grew up we grew up fooling ourselves, believing that that because we were dark of the sun, we were of less value. And all except me, of course, and and the corner where corner which I live, corner which I held. Couldn't easily categorize me because my paternal grandmother was near white. So while my grandfather was black, his wife, my grand my grandmother was near white. So I kind of could straddle the fence. Side. <laughs> they dare not tell me anything because I would go home and tell my mom, them Bokra people, don't pay them any mind, my son. They're not to be trusted. And they're just trying to mess your head up. That's exactly what she'd tell me. But I'll tell you a personal story. Even the churches were segregated. Even the churches were segregated. My paternal grandfather was a Presbyterian, so he went to church on Sunday. My grandmother was a Seventh-day Adventist. She went to church on a Saturday. So one Sunday, we had this practice. This was a, this was a practice because in those days, we had siestas. Every, 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 every midday, the stores would close about 12 to 3. So we'd sleep and relax and open up in the afternoon around 4 o'clock. So Sunday time, after church, we would gather on the veranda and chill out after lunch. So this Sunday, I was a boy about 9 years old. I will never forget this story for as long as I live. And I tell it without shame. We're on the veranda once this Sunday, and my grandfather, because he had emigrated to the United States, and he came back with a southern accent. My grandfather says to my, my grandfather says to my grandmother, Gigi, Gigi, that was her name of endearment. There was not a black soul in church today. And my grandmother, just for a moment, good Adventist that she was, said, then pray tell me, Scoville, where were you? <laughs> I watched my grandfather. He just turned his chair to where his face was in the wind, and he didn't speak for the rest of the hour. <laughs> So they may tell you that there's no prejudice, but they can't tell me. Because when they tell me that, I tell them my story. And so that's how it is. But eventually, eventually, with Gerard, the, 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 the edge of the racism was blunted, blunted so that it was not so public. But you have to understand, Cayman was a colony colonial and racism is synonymous with empire and colonialism so we cannot escape it it's only now we see it because the whole educational system the system that i grew up under was structured based upon race the black children they went to certain schools and the children of the near white went to a different kind of school. And the only reason why people like me got educated was because they were enlightened people who realized that they were smart black students. But even the school they built for us 
and your board chairman was when we went to we went to that school together. Even the school they built for us was a little different. So imagine if we had had access to the schools they had for the white students, but we, all of us would have probably been Rhodes Scholars. You know? So we come into the 21st, the 20th century, the late 20th century. And the Cayman Islands, because of the remittances with seamen, there was a certain liberalization of the economy. And then you couldn't tell by color necessarily who was poor and who was not poor. You saw black people who were wealthy, and you saw black people who were poor, just like you saw white people who were wealthy and white people who were not so wealthy. So we've this is the point at which we've come. But we have not reached the stage of maturity where we celebrate, we celebrate the achievements of black people like they do in some of the other Caribbean countries because our problem is that we never really gave educational attainment the credit it deserves. We don't place emphasis on being lettered. We place emphasis on being wealthy. And so wealth in the sense of many people, now it's changing, wealth in the sense of many people derived from who you were, who your mama was, who your papa was, rather than earning it through being lettered, going to college or going to university and adopting a profession. Now, happily, that is changing in the 21st century, but before it wasn't so. There is, however, still a struggle. So there is, in a sense, a battle still going on. into not color, but it is based on nationality. Kind of unknowing. I won't say ignorance because ignorance is a strong word, unknowing. You have to understand that the Cayman Islands were an isolated colonial outpost. There were no indigenous people here. It's a totally imported society, totally imported society, which is good to know. And so everyone here come, came from someplace else, including me, including my ancestors who were here or from the 1700s. But I say that to say, that's why when I, in my writings, I don't talk about indigenous Caymanians, because the only indigenous Caymanians I know are the Agutis, the Turtles, and the blue iguana, the blue iguana, so the blue iguana. So there are no indigenous Caymanians. I say we are established Caymanians, people who were here by virtue of longevity, may have been years. And so by that, they can claim certain ancestral rights and privileges, ownership of land, belonger status by virtue of even here, of generations. And so that's why I'm trying to break the prejudice down. I'm trying to break the prejudice down. People don't like that when you say, when, when, I, when I tell them, look, this is a totally important, what do you mean it's a totally important society? That's right. That is right because if we never had any Amerindians. There is no historical proof of any Amerindians being here permanently. So all of us, the people of African descent, came either as slaves or as people running from some kind of slavery and seeking freedom. And the rest of the people that came here are this for all the ladies here. Per capita, Kiman had some of the richest women in the whole Caribbean, probably in the world. Many of them were widows, and uh, they, they later married people, or people married them, and came into great wealth. Always had a penchant 
for white expatriates. I want to give you two examples of that. In 1831, in 1831, a slave owning Yankee by the name of Nathaniel Glover found his way into the Cayman Islands. Okay, so the Caymanian people, so enamored by this wetness of skin, elevated him. First to a justice of the peace, and then they made him a magistrate. And then they thought they were doing themselves a great favor. And they sent it up to England. He was scored, he ran a pen to it and said, no, no, never. He is an alien, he's an American citizen. He can't hold any official position in the Cayman Islands. So get that out of your heads. So that's not, that's the first place. There's another celebrated case that many people don't know, a man called Richard Phelan, an Irish came here in a shipwreck. He married the sister-in-law of Nathaniel Glover. Listen to this story. This is really a great story. <laughs> Richard Phelan was, the, 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 the recorder said his position, his economic position was worse than slaves. Slaves in Cayman. But the man was industrious. He peddled them from the thatch farm. He made hats and baskets and peddled them house to house from Bordentown to North Side till he made enough money. Then he struck up a partnership with a wealthy Caymanian ship owner of an established family called Samuel Parsons. Richard Phelan was so wealthy. In later life, he developed cancer. Richard Phelan was so, became so wealthy that he went for treatment in New Orleans because you know that it was the French Madame Curie and her husband who invented the radiation. He went to New Orleans to get radiation treatment for his cancer. And he had so much money. He must have stayed there for about a year or so. And he came back to Cayman. He eventually died here. But in his will, because his do he had a daughter who had died before him. So then he went up, he was in, in his will, made a lot will. He even gave money to the people of the county in Kilkenny, Ireland, where he came from. So those are two examples of extreme. One, demonstrating prejudice. The other one, demonstrating if you're industrious, how you can make it, how these people, because Richard, but it, it's too bad that we don't have these, these stories in our history so that our young people especially can read and appreciate. I mean, many people now, if you tell people to go and get the Taj Palm and become a craftsman, they drive you, they run you out of town. You know, um, I, I, I want to digress a little bit. You know, there was a debate raging about how to uplift the people of lesser means. And I said, well, we have many great examples, you know, the one that I am familiar with and that I advocate is what Muhammad Yunus did in Bangladesh with the Grameen Bank. How he empowered these women because in Islamic societies, women have no social, no economic importance, no standing. Muhammad Yunus was a professor at Vatican University. He went to his, his country, he took money out of his pocket and loaned these women to set up cottage industries. You know what, you know what somebody wrote and said, you are advocating people selling jams and jellies. What's wrong with that? You know how many of these people are wealthy? Why, they buy one sewing machine and they got a contract to sew uniforms for a school or for any uniform organization and they take it from there until, until they can help themselves. They lift themselves out of poverty. You know, so, so people are saying, that's what we have the NAU for. <laughs> I, I can't I can't understand the philosophy. So in many in many ways, our society is still a society that is so steeped in colonialism that they kill us. They don't want us to help ourselves because they believe that it is our lot if you are a certain class or a certain color, to remain poor, to remain vulnerable, to remain to them. So 
blackness in Caymanian society. Blackness in Caymanian society, as I told you before, was something that was deemed less than. And so now we have a phenomenon where all the men, all the Caymanian men, leave their faithful Caymanian wives looking for women with poor skin and straight hair. Yeah. That's what we call it. Papa skin. All, all, all came out, the men of God. Men of God. Those called the yala. Yala skin. <laughs> they didn't say yala, they said yala skin. Papa skin and straight hair. And so they get enamored with all of these ladies who come like that. Come from the Dominican Republic. Come from Honduras. Come from the Philippines. I hear the stories. I consider that I was blessed. Because where I grew up on guard house, I tell of the Fulton and Cooper's in class all the time, and I grew up on guard house, I eavesdropped all these old men. They were so wise. I heard them talking of their experiences. And so as a young man, I never, thank God, fell into certain traps because I heard them saying, the women, they really don't like black people. It's the money. <laughs> so I never fell into certain traps. And so and so we have we have a phenomenon that's changing now in, in, in the society because the people who are true and faithful are now being sidelined to those who are more glamorous. And I, it, it, it bothers me as a as a social and cultural inquisitor. How these men went all over the world, all over the world, and came back to their wives. And I know they weren't good. But <laughs> they didn't, the, the allotment came, and the affection was there. And now, the whole thing is reversed. They, they, Dishonor their wives and they flaunt. I said, wow, what is this? And it's, 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 it's bringing pressure to bear on the, on the society that you don't know. And so there's, there's a whole dissing, dissing of, of, of not, well, it is blackness too, but it's, 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 it's Caymanianness. It's a way of saying that if you're a Caymanian, you're really not, you're really not good enough. You don't cut it. And in most instances, being Cayman in these cases are synonymous with being black. So we have a real, real struggle. We have a real struggle. And it's disenfranchising many Cayman women. Fortunately for them, they took advantage of education. So in positions where they can fend for themselves economically, but it takes a big toll when the families are split. Who gets the children? Because invariably, they lose the house. And so there's a whole transformation in the society, okay? Uh, now, blackness in my world. One of the themes in my writing that I try to do, sometimes subtly, sometimes not so subtly, is to bring attention to what I think is the importance of Acknowledging that blackness is a part of Caymanian society, that we can't get away from that. That there was great miscegenation. I, I, I believe that there is no Caymanian who is truly black, just like there is no Caymanian who is truly white. That's why when I talk about white people, I call them near whites, especially if they're Caymanian. Because, first of all, the slavery that existed was a domestic type of slavery. And so you can see right away the penchant, the opportunities for admixture across the racial lines, miscegenation. So that is one thing I, I try to highlight. The second thing is I read in such a way that I want to represent reality because not all black people were poor. Not all black people were disenfranchised. And in the story of 
the death of Artemetra Johnson in a gathering of old men. I make that point clearly. Here was a woman, a God-fearing widow, rich in land. And she was up against a struggle because there was this near white commander who believed he was British. And that because this woman was black and disenfranchised, she should not be the title holder for all that land, which was valuable. So there was a, there was a struggle. In the same book of stories, there's another one called um, The Young Lady and How Pearl Lost Her False Team. And that's a, that's, that's, that's a true story from its very simplest. In, in Old Cayman, it was a mark of standing, social standing, to have either a tooth of gold or a gold-plated tooth in, in the mouth, where it was obvious. And during the war, when the Americans had the base, Ball Pit, right behind the library, the base was called Ball Pit. There was a competition because the white folk believed that their daughters should have a sole monopoly on the white men. And there were lots of stories about women, white women not being virtuous. And here's a story of a sailor, white sailor, falling in love with a black woman who was virtuous. And there was a big hollow balloon because her family thought that she should not have that white man. That white man should go to white woman should be the husband. That white man should be the husband of a white woman. And there followed a battle royal, the black woman won out. In stories my grandfather never told me, the mama son, here's a black woman who was smart, qualified, but couldn't get a job because of her color. So what does she do? She uses her ingenuity and decides to cater to the tastes and the, and, and, and the whims and fancies. So she turns herself into a man and makes the money off, off the fantasies of these people. That's a pain of the community. Right? So I'll pause. Give you a chance for questions, comments, answers. And then I'll talk about a long series of oh. yeah. I'm curious, sir. It's often said that when the United States sneezes, a man catches pneumonia. I was a fool. <laughs> no, it's pneumonia. It's pneumonia. <laughs> it's pneumonia. So um, there are interesting things going on with respect to education in the United States right now. I'm thinking specifically about the governor of Florida and his attempts to extricate efforts to teach black people. Um, do you envision that sort of a backlash coming down to Cayman? It was here before it was in Florida. <laughs> it was here before it was in Florida, so perhaps, so perhaps Governor DeSantis is, 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 is copying the, I was surprised, I was surprised and, and um, when this, when, this, when this celebration becomes public, I'm curious to read what the public is going to think. You know, because years ago, some years ago, I remember some people tried to celebrate Black History Month. The comments weren't good. They were negative because there, there is something about the whole notion of talking about blackness in Cayman society which set the teeth of many people on edge, and they don't like to hear that. Personally, one, one of the things that I have to cope with is I was branded a black power advocate. And it, it, it took years 
to wash that off. Well, I never made any apologies. I never made any apologies, and some people still think that of that way, but it's less important now. But Caymanians, like I say, that is a taboo subject. It, it's Kenjite, it's, it's, it's a forbidden subject. And Caymanians prefer to speak of that like how politicians were discussed in my house. It, it prefer to speak of that in tones, as if you're talking about ghosts that you don't want to come back. So I, 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 I wouldn't doubt that. I would not. Several times when I was here as president, it crossed my mind, but I knew that that would have shortened my tenure. So I said, I better find something else to do. Better find something else more constructive to do. Let's do that. Yeah. Yes? Um, two things. So, some of these people don't believe that they could see us at that. That it was, it was actually in place in the 60s. So yes. you hear that word, that that's right. That's right. And, and, and it's an influence of the Latin people. Because Kitman had a, we, we had a great affiliation. You know, at one time, there were more Caymanians in the Bay Islands of Honduras, Guanaja, Utila, and uh, Rotan, than they were in Cayman. More Caymanians there than they were in Cayman. So that siesta thing, it come, that's the influence it comes from. And there are lots of Caymans there now. Because this is what I try to tell Caymans when I try to erase the prejudice. I'm on a mission. I'm doing some research now. I'm doing some research now. I'm writing a book. And what I'm doing with research on now is the contribution of Jamaicans to the development of Cayman and society. In education, in medicine, But there is an undercurrent. There's an undercurrent, and it's a growing undercurrent. And it's an undercurrent which is caused from ignorance because we don't know our history. And so I'm trying, I'm trying to say, hey, is a true. Here's what we and so that is a problem. That's now. I would encourage people to write about the way it's not a it's it's not a thing that write about the kind of people will be popular. I so much depends, hangs on this universal college. This universal college has to be the honest <coughs> By which we look I mean for ourselves. Because there is no other way. There's no other way. And so I'm happy to see the numbers of humanity students enrolled here growing. Because this is a good place. This is a good place. Yes. Yeah. Second part of do you still think that prejudices that affect people in the city are still have some not among the young people. Not among the young people. Young people, young people see each other in those terms. But the older people, yeah, the older royalists. And there's another thing that I, I wanted to tell you. I'm glad you brought that up. Here, older people here are more British than the real English. <laughs> yeah. They, they, they have. So they they have an affiliation. They have an affiliation with British. So much so that years ago, some people in the civil service was trying to convince me that a BA degree from an English university was valued more than a BA degree from an American or Canadian university. But they didn't have a degree themselves. <laughs> Listening to you describe what it was like in the early days and in the practice and so on, the initial thing, um, and what where we are now in Cayman, and I'm looking back in Jamaica. My grandmother was born in 1897, so there was a lot that I experienced with her 
one of those near white. <laughs> and um, you know, the prejudice in terms of color. And I'm looking as we move forward and where we are now in Jamaica, I think we'll eventually get there where we talk about out of 21 people. And I even think about jobs as a young teenager. If you're not a certain color, you couldn't work in the bank. So mm -hmm. many of those things mm -hmm. is as if the steps you are going through here in Cayman, you're almost mirroring the steps Jamaica went through. You know? right. And you're now at the stage where it's a case of not necessarily the color, but the cash. Who has the most? But there's still a divide in Jamaica. But we talk about uptown, downtown. You know, and it's usually the, those who are, yeah, who are well off who are the uptown versus the downtown, that sort of thing. You don't have uptown and downtown. You have, might be, I talk about South and South. No, well, I don't. Uh, <laughs> it's a, a similar. I think they have, they, they have, the phenomenon now is they have gated communities. Oh, yeah. Oh, yes. Gated communities. That, that's, that, that's, that's the, that's the phenomenon. Yeah, yeah. But, but, what makes it a little more, how should I put it, less obvious in Caymanian society is that you have a lot of wealth of black people. And that's the problem of our society, the development of our society, because these wealth of black people move out of the neighborhoods from oh, which yeah. they grew up yeah. and move into these gated communities, thus depriving their neighbors of examples of mentorship of any kind of association and connection to say well you can do this too because it's a status thing status thing i have a poem in my next poetry book called status symbol how they, they live in these places like grand harbor and um all, all all these all these kinds of places there are places that you go to you take a drive yeah if you if you go through them and you drive slowly, too slowly, they'll call the police on you. Yeah. But they think you're just yeah. casing the joint and loitering. You know, I'm, I'm telling you, and, and this and, and this is the Cayman that we're facing. It, so so I, I suggested that we have an identity crisis. We have an identity crisis because many of us really don't want to know who we are and from whence we came. And that's the problem with the young people because they come and find the table set, but nobody tells them it was not always like this. And nobody tells them about this generational sacrifice and the ancestral sweat that went into getting things at the level they are now. And so that's the problem because we don't, we don't teach these things in, in schools. We don't, we have, we, we have no connection, no, no Caymanian authors, no Caymanian mentors. No one comes into the schools and, and tell the people how it was. Yes. No, it's because they see the Caymanian spouse, the female, as being docile, as not fighting for what is her right, as giving up to win. Because I, I could tell you stories, they don't win. They do not win. And many of them wind up coming back to the Caymanian spouse with nothing. Talking about that, that they associate with dinner parties that they just come, but they can't.
That's not so because all the all the census I saw they had listed by color, black, white, mixed, colored. They, so they knew, they knew the colors, and they put them out according to that. And by the way, colored people and black people. One town was the slave capital. Black people had slaves too. You need to you need to read the history of a woman called Elizabeth Jane Trusted. She was a slave. Her owner gave her freedom. She made so much money. Elizabeth Jane trusted. You know how many slaves she manumitted? How many slaves she bought? All like 100 pounds, 65 pounds, and made them free? Yeah. So it, 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 in, in Cayman, it was not uncommon for black people to be slave owners, to people of color to be slave owners. It was not exclusively white. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> it was nothing to us, but now that we, you know, I sat down and had this whole discussion, I see where it did take place within my own family. This person had been killed, or this child had been killed in Spain, and we told them, no, we don't see this like how you guys do here. We didn't see that in Cayman, but then thinking about it, it's true. We did face it. We just didn't take it the same. I'm just asking for some professional advice. Um, I am Black History Month. Last week I did uh, Stephen Biko. This week I'm doing John Lewis. Today I put up John Lewis crossing the bridge with a banner, that same bridge that he got. And one of my students said to me, Miss. Uh, my colleague said I'm actually teaching hate and racism. And I was really taken aback. Professional advice, how do I respond? How do I make sure I teach black history, but it's not seen in this light? <laughs> well, no, it, 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 it can't be separate, but you're teaching, you're teaching, you're, you're teaching black history. You see, that's, that's the challenge. We've been grown up with the Eurocentric view. And when, when, when we take a different perspective, Afrocentric, then a lot of people, they feel threatened because they don't understand. So the only way I, the only, I would suggest to you to tell them, look, all along, we were taught when I was growing up, they told me all kinds of nonsense when the slaves rebelled it. They were bad. Oh, the slaves are bad for rebelling. It wasn't until I came upon this enlightened professor who said, let me tell you something what happened to the slaves. They were raped. They were whipped. Wait till I tell you a sort of long Celia and I can go to dinner too. And, and, and that's what's happened. So this is a story from our side because there's an old African proverb that says until the lion writes the tale of the hunt. The tale will always glorify the hunter. That's true. That's true. Yes. Yes. So you can put that in a vernacular that they can understand. <laughs> and quite often, the, the, the true story is an extrapolation of your side and my side. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. That's the only way. But that's a, quite a natural uh, response from them. Just, just be careful. They don't record you and try to slander you and say that. That's what you're doing. Why are you teaching about the culture? Yeah. 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 I don't know if you have time. Yes, I do. 
But uh, there's like two things. One, um, you mentioned about the um, the undercurrent of uh, a person of understanding okay. the contribution of the rate of payments development. Um, how would you um, explain and interpret for us to understand that one? And two, how do you uh, how do we of the society in general address uh, and the students in not understanding where they're from? Because I overheard a conversation with students on Monday where one student was telling a group about these activities and the young lady's response was that I am black. Yeah, um, and I've heard it several times from students here. First is your complexion, my complexion, and that or I say yeah, one student from her uncle is darker than me, but he does not think he's black. Right? How do you address this in a society? Well, I, I address it by saying this, that given, given the nature, given, given the settlement patterns of the society in which we live, there can be no denying of the fact that we are not white. So I know they don't and they don't and they don't accept it. And so it's best in those arguments. Discretion is a better part of valor. When you say that back off. Don't entertain the back off because my cousins told me that that they went to see with many many came out there. Many Caymans guys they went to school with, and they say, "Well, we're white until they got to South Africa." Tell us about Long Celia. Long Celia, Long Celia is, to my judgment, the only person who would qualify to be a national hero by the criteria I know. Country set for national hero, the Cayman. The people that we have. We call national heroes. They should be in a pantheon for builders of the society. But Long Celia was the slave. They call her Long Celia because she was about six foot four tall. This woman. Six foot four. She was the slave of an owner called Thomas Knowles Eden in Savannah in Borden Town. In 1820, they got wind. And this is kind of similar to the story of Sam Sharp. They got wind that the free papers had come down saying that the slaves were to be manumitted. And there was a boat plied between here and Jamaica called the Mackerel. And some, someone, apparently one of the crewmen or someone told Long Celia this story about this suspicious package, which they thought contained the instructions for the white people to free the slaves. And Long Celia did her investigations and concluded that there was some substance. Anyway, she decided when things weren't panning out to foment an insurrection. But she made the mistake of confiding in a woman she thought was a friend of hers, Sarah Harborn. Sarah. Sarah Harborn ratted her out. They charged along Celia with sedition, which was a serious charge. Arrested her. They asked the courts. Um, took her to the when they charged him for threatening one of his owners. Took her to the slave court. In this slave court, every officer was white. And they charged Long Celia. She was pronounced guilty. They took her to the sky. Stripped her. And gave her 50 lashes with a cat. 50 lashes but they didn't broke her and she 
survive. She said, but after, after that, it was an incident. After that, open, giving flashes with the camera. That is the story. Famous, famous woman, famous woman. Another thing she did too, she did not let herself be conquered by those philandering, lecherous old white men. I <laughs> said. Well, on behalf of UCCI and the Black History Committee, um, I just want to say how enlightened we all feel in this room for the most incredible, incredible delivery and incredible presentation on certain things that I was completely ignorant of myself. Um, I hope everyone in this room can actually agree with me that that was one of the most amazing, amazing presentations on the history of the Cayman Islands and all the several nuances that we see around us and we're not necessarily aware where they come from. And it's really, really enlightening you've done this for us. So we've just got a few presentations for you um, to show our appreciation. You know that I really didn't expect <laughs> On behalf of UCCI, thank you very much. It's so wonderful to have you back. <laughs> and on behalf of the Black History Committee, again, I want to thank Dr. Fulton Cooper for coming up with this amazing idea of getting us together. The number of people in this room is just, of course, not just because of your amazing, um, <laughs> just amazing person, uh, personality in this room, but also, the topics we've been talking about, even when we had the session last Wednesday, it shows it's so important for us. And the number of students in this room, I know some of you might be getting extra credit, but, <laughs> but you don't have to be here in certain cases. And we, it just, it has really opened my eyes. And I'm very, I feel very proud to be here at UCCI, to be leading the way. I was listening to the radio the other day, Cayman is being criticized for not talking about black history at all. Nothing else is going on on this island right now, but what's happening here at UCCI where we're celebrating black history Month. So we really need to... We should really applaud our efforts in being pioneers and leaders here in the Cayman Islands. And people will follow the lead that we are setting. And I hope this will be a permanent fixture on the annual calendar here at UCCI. Thank you so much. I want to footnote what I've said. I issuing, issuing a challenge. <clears throat> and this challenge comes from one who is a student of this society. The Cayman Islands are really in a critical part of their existence. And what is needed now is an honest broker. Because we have a proliferation of different nationalities, which should ideally be mixed into one unit so that we can be a truly unified society. But for that to happen, what is needed is an honest broker. This university college has to be that honest broker. That's, that's the kind of vision I had when I was here as a president. This university college has the credibility, the qualifications, and can develop the trust to be an honest broker. A politician cannot be an honest broker because they speak out of both sides of their mouth. <laughs> so the politicians can't be an honest broker. It needs someone who has no vested interest in their constituency or self-promotion. That's what I look forward to seeing UCCI develop 
into. So thanks again for your invitation. I am humble. Thank you, Mr. Barton. Thank you so much. Thank you too, ladies and gentlemen, for being here. There's constant reference to the BHM Black, Black History Month Committee. Just to quickly state that that is comprised of Dr. Erica Gordon, Winston Smith, Dr. Khadija Swearing, Mr. Inanda, um, Dr. Chris, myself, and Dr. Ivan, Dr. Geneve, um, as Dean of the Arts and Humanities, and of course, the incomparable Dr. Monica Lawrence. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, very quickly, we have provided refreshment. I'll ask you to please join us for that, but it would be remiss of me not to remind, especially your students, that the next step is the video competition. So we have asked our students to enter a video competition, a one minute video where you're answering the question, what does Black History Month mean to me? The flyers are all over campus and the submission deadline is Friday of this week. We've already got one or two, but we want to encourage our students to please support that. And you will notice that we're changing the patterns at UCCI a little bit. We invite our students and faculty to please join us next week, Friday the 17th. Wear something African, an African accessory, an African garb if you can. And just come out and let's have a good time. We're going to be having a lunch hour concert, a fashion show, displays this Friday, next Friday. We want to tie it all together next week, Friday the 17th, with everybody participating in, how, in however manner you can. So please bear that in mind. And next week, Wednesday, in the same room from 1 to 2.30 p.m., we are going to be having our final presentation. The Dean of um, the Division of Humanities and Social Science and myself will be making the final two presentations. So please join us then as well. Thanks again to those of you online. Happy that you could join. Thank you, ladies and gentlemen. And thank you to Mr. Bobber.